Ah, forgot to turn on the microphone. Ah, first fail. <laughs> What's going on, everyone? What's going on, Beatport, Twitch Vibes, House Nation? Today I'm giving you a DJ Masterclass for my studio sessions, and uh, I'm doing these in conjunction with Beatport, kind of sharing some of the knowledge that I've accrued over the years, and you will probably be able to see that I've got a very lovely setup here. I've got the V10 mixer, four CDJ 3000s, and kind of what I want to do today is see if you have any questions, show you a little, about, a little bit about how I do my sessions. I like to do something that's called remixing live. So everything, if you guys have ever been to any one of my sets and you hear kind of like these different versions of tracks that you may have heard before, chances are I've remixed it on the spot using four CDJs. Uh, and that's me doing a process of looping, acapellas, layering tracks over tracks. It gets pretty involved and pretty intricate. So I'm going to do a quick little demonstration of some of the things that I'll do live. And then if you guys have any questions for me, please feel free to ask. Uh, I am going to also get into how I organize my music on my USBs. Uh, I don't have the computer set up to show you um, record box, but that's something that I went over. If you want to go check out the Pioneer website at some point in time, I did a, a master class on how to organize your record box. So I'm just going to assume you guys are playing on CDJs and you know how to set up your record box. Now I want to show you kind of a vibe of what I do when I'm in the mix. So let me uh, get a little vibe going on, do a little mix, and I'll come right back to you. So that's just go. Hey, what's going on, Fed Crevo? What's going on, everyone out there? That's just a quick little uh, demonstration of how I'm layering a bunch of different tracks. And as you could probably see, I had three tracks going the majority of the time. And then I brought in a snare roll breakdown to drop into the remix that I did of Follow Me by Furious. Follow me. Uh, one of the things that I think is important is getting to know your tracks i tend to do a lot of looping on the fly which means that i may listen to a track and just kind of get a vibe off of it before i'm actually you know 
looping the track to layer it. So sometimes I'll have all of my music organized in such a way that I can find it very, very quickly, test it out in my headphones, and then drop it into the mix. So, yeah, uh, what's going on, Data Vismo? Yeah, and I actually tend to use not just three CDJs, but four. So this is a pretty advanced way of, of doing your live sets. And what it really means is there's a lot of preparation involved. Um, so I'm just going to stop this for one second and just kind of give you guys a little bit of a picture of what it is that I'm doing. Put a little bit of music in the low in the background. So Mike, if, if, as my man Mike is in the background, he's kind of helping me do all of my, um, all of my scene changes. I'm going to pop that over there. If you're looking at this CDJ, I've got a loop going. Now that is a an eight bar loop. What you heard me do with the deep inside sample was I would take the eight bar loop, then I would start chopping it down, making it smaller, and then that gives you almost like a snare roll. And then what I'm doing over here is I'm using the filter from the V10 to take out all the bottom end and create this filtering snare roll out of a loop. And then if I just want to come out of it, the good thing about the 3000s and even the CDJ Nexus 2 2000s is they go straight back in on the top of the one. Um, I also have the quantize button on when I'm looping. And the reason I have that on is because it just makes the loops very, very tight. So what you saw me doing here was taking this baseline loop from this uh, Reva Star remix of the track. And then I went over to the Deep Inside track. I'm going to re-loop it again. So when I'm, sorry about that, so when I'm actually queuing up a track to loop on the fly, I may just do this in my headphones. So I've got that loop going, and then I re-trigger it, put a delay on it. Drop it. Now, one of the other things that I really enjoy doing is, as I'm doing these very intricate mixes, I'm queuing up for the next track that I'm going to drop into. So, one of the things that people will, will tell me they hear during my sets is that the buildups and the drops come in in places where they kind of weren't expecting it. And because I'm running all of these tracks at the same time, what I tend to do is to go one bar right before the drop. So I'm looking at it on my CJ. Um, I'm going to do it this time. Uh, let's get a little closer in here. So over here, on, uh, this one. so this is one bar right before the breakdown. Now what that does is, as I'm mixing this track in, so here we go. Right, let's have, let's see, I have another track that's playing. That's at the breakdown. I'm gonna want to let me just fast forward a little bit, just kind of get into the track. So I want to drop into the next track. But I want to mix it in such a way that I know exactly when that drop is going to happen. So here I have a loop. Now what I've done is I've taken the bottom end out using the filter on the track that I'm bringing in. So as I'm blending it in and as I'm bringing up the mix, it's really subtle. You kind of don't hear it, uh, but it just kind of creeps in on you. So 
So now what happens is I've just dropped into the break of both tracks. So this one, which is the Body Roots track from my man Marco Lees, has this really dope sax going on, but I've broken it down to the bass line section of the mouth to mouth. Now I'm looking at both of these, and there's a break coming in where the beat's gonna drop in, but that one's not ready yet. So here it is, I loop it one bar before. The other one's creeping in. I'm taking the bottom end out, filtering it, because we're about to get into the drop. And you're counting it by one bars. So what that does is it gives you precise timing when you're dropping into your breaks, right into, let's say, the next track that you want to transition into. Hey, Mal, uh, let me see if I got that. Malka Skiff. Yes, it's also called phrasing. Now, what's interesting is a lot of my friends who go to like DJ academies and so on and so forth, they've come up with, <laughs> with, the, with the actual um, definitions for all of these. I actually never went to a DJ school. I kind of picked this up along the way just by practicing over the years. So I may not uh, call these by the textbook names that you maybe have heard in different um, DJ schools. But yes, that's phrasing. And what the importance of it is, is creating a seamless mix from going from one vibe to another. Uh, let's see. So one of the things that's really interesting is developing tension and breaks within your sets. So here I am, I've got the mouth to mouth going by Reva Star. I'm gonna search for another track. Now, here's one thing I tend to do. As opposed to the way some people program their sets, I will actually just, in my playlist, list the tracks in the order and in playlists of the kind of tracks so that I can find them very, very quickly. I actually never know what I'm going to play until I'm literally right in front of the audience. And the reason for that is it allows me flexibility to adapt my set to the vibe. Some of my sets may be more tribal. Some of them may be more soulful, a bit deeper. Um, the, uh, the vibes that I feed off of the crowd, I have to know where my music is in order to play it. And I'm just looking at some of your questions, by the way. Uh, what's going on, Waterproof Hoodie? Uh, what's going on, Degsy? What's going on, Degsy? But by the way, just shout out to Degsy. That's my man who's the drummer for Jamiroquai. So what's going on, Derek? Good to see you on here. Um, now, he just asked me, how do I drop vocals in from another track and make it all sound in key? A lot of what I learned from playing on vinyl is how to mix in key by ear, as opposed to doing it um, by manipulating it technologically. But what you can do is you can adjust the, um, one of the settings here that will change the key of the track. That being said, on record box, when you analyze all of the tracks and you set up your playlist, it gives you what keys these tracks are in. So you could literally look and see, well, I know this vocal kind of goes with this track because of the key. And then you can put master, uh, master tempo. You can just kind of put on the overhead. The master tempo key, that will keep it in, this, in the same pitch, in the same pitch of the track of the vocal but then you could change sorry keep it in the same key of the vocal but then you could shift the pitch to match the speed so for example i'm gonna continue with this uh let me find a different loop real quick and i'm gonna give you an example of a of an acapella vibe so let's see i am going to
what you may have just seen me do is when I transition out of some of my tracks, I'll echo out. And what I've done is with the V10, I can select the individual channel that I'm going to put the effect on. Uh, I like the spiral effect uh, that I love to use. It's kind of like this delay with a bit of a spin out. And then um, I usually do it at three quarters um, in terms of the timing of it to get the kind of da -da 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 echoing effect. I'll use the filter to take out the bottom end as the track is, as I pull the track out. So once you put the effect on it and you pull the fader down, the effect will continue going. But it gives you a very cool echoing out of an effect if you want to get out of a track quickly or sometimes you may get a skip and you need a real quick exit that's happened to me don't think it doesn't uh and that effect is really really useful because you can take the bottom end out you could put it over the entire track and make everything sound like it belonged that way so here we have a loop that i've just come up with i'm gonna find an acapella and i tend to do like i said i go by ear on these so let's see track. What I just did is something that I really love doing live. Uh, I locked in the acapella for Turn On The Music. Um, and what I was doing is, since I put it on master tempo, basically I can adjust manually the timing of it because some acapellas aren't locked precisely. So I was able to slightly adjust it, but as opposed to doing it with vinyl, you don't hear the so I'm able to, by ear, hear these kind of micro tempo changes to make sure that I'm catching that. And I'm using the uh, pitch adjust to kind of ride it. Again, that comes from playing on vinyl, using the pitch adjust to ride the, uh, the timing of it. However, the, good, the thing that I love about using the CDJs is it lets you do little tricks. So as you saw, I looped, I took off the quantizer. Now this is important. This is kind of a technique I made up early on when Pioneer first started coming out with these loop buttons on their CDJs. I would take the in, the in point and the out point of the cue. So just to kind of, let me shut that off for one second just to give you an idea. It's time you turn on the music. Feel that sound. So that gives you that loop point. But now I want to create a bit more dramatic tension, and then I'll take the end of the cue of the loop point and start bringing it closer. I'll use an effect to give it a bit more of that. Now, once I got it to a place where it's almost like rattling, I change the tempo to wide. I like having it in the center when I do that so that the tempo, so that the pitch doesn't change. And then I'll bring it up to create this kind of pitch rise. And then... I, 
I use the pitch adjust as a pitch bend to create this kind of weird modulating effect. And it works really, really very, very well with acapellas to allow you to create, especially if you have a breakdown, you have a snare roll, you want to create some real dramatic tension before going into either a breakdown or coming out of a breakdown, you then use the delay to allow you to give you this huge effect, but you use the pitch modulation to be able to create just something weird that adds dramatic tension over the tracks. All right, let's see if you guys are enjoying that. Um, say again, brother? Do you use Camelot or traditional keys? Do I use traditional Camelot? Uh, no, I use, tra I use traditional keys. All right, so my setting on this tends to be with vinyl on the CDJs. I use the vinyl um, on the jog mode because it gives me the closest feel to using vinyl. That's where I came from. Um, the other thing is vinyl allows you to scratch. And I come from a, like a hip hop background. My old school days were funk, soul, disco, early hip hop. When house music came along, I just dove straight into that. So I tend to use the vinyl jog mode here. Then I will um, go from either plus six when I'm just doing my gradual mixes to plus 10 is where I tend to be in terms of the pitch range, except for when I want to go to my more extreme um, pitch bends, which is when I go to wide. Um, so just let's get a quick close in on this. Uh, here you'll see there are a couple, there's a, there's a little button, it may be a little bit hard to see on your screen, but that one says plus six, and then you could change it to plus 10, plus 16, and wide. I tend to skip the plus 16 because I never really use it, but I'm between plus six and plus 10, just to give me enough of a range when I want to get the tracks in kind of like the right tempo. Uh, I tend to play between like a 120, to anywhere to 122 to 126, usually around 124, 125 is where I kind of feel that sweet spot for me is. It used to be 128, kind of fast there. Some people are playing 130. I think the BPM really only depends on you, your style, and the kind of audience you have. If you're kind of playing to a more techno crowd, you may want to, you know, be a little higher on the BPM. <clears throat> if you're more on a house crowd, it tends to be a little bit sexier as the tempo is close to like 122, 124. Let me grab a little bit of water <coughs> as my throat gets a little dry here. Mm. Um, hey, Neil, what's going on? So Neil's asked me, what are my tips for mixing between big differences in BPM? So here's where you really have to get creative. And this tends to be more of an open format DJ type of thing. So let's say... There's a couple of ways to go about it. You can either create a transition using an effect. So let's say, uh, let me see. I'm going to go to my hot cues over here because I did set up a couple of things. <clears throat> <clears throat> Where I had these loops. Oh, let's go to... Where are we? So hey, let's say you're playing an open format and you've got a hip hop type of um, format that you're in. You'll be looking at the BPM, and here it's giving you the double time. So what I tend to do is one of two things. If you're playing it at original BPM, you want to transition to a house thing, a house tempo. You can either use an effect to create a breakdown.
create this dramatic change between tempos, you can either do one of two things. You can either create... Which especially if you're coming out of a set that was predominantly hip hop or predominantly a different vibe, let's say you're playing or you're coming in after a DJ that had a different format and you want to transition, that's what I call the cold break. It's kind of like you're going to reset everything, use an effect, get out of the previous vibe, but do it in such a way where you create an exit from the previous track. The other way I like to do it is this. If you have a track that... That lends itself to a more um, <coughs> beat. You can slow it down gradually so that you have a double time. I tend to use a lot of dub reggae and hip hop techniques. I'll backspin out of a track, scratch into it, re-trigger. These are things to allow you to transition from a tempo that's in essence half of what your house tempo is. Um, if, the tra- if the change in tempo is going to be too dramatic to take it to basically what you would be doing, doubling up the speed to go into a house speed, <clears throat> then I definitely recommend using an effect to transition from a completely different BPM track and maybe take the end and loop the end, do what I did with the cue where you take off the quantize and you kind of spin out the end, maybe even transition up and down with the uh, dramatic wide pitch adjust and echo out of it, use an effect, and then drop into the next track. It's dramatic, and especially if you're transitioning from a different DJ to your set, it gives a clear break between different types of genres. All right, let's see. Hey, what's going on, A-Y-O-D? I miss all of you. I wish I was able to play for you guys on the dance floors. And actually, here in Miami, I've been playing at Treehouse recently. So some places, you might just catch me, but... I also, I've got, by the way, if you guys want to catch me live, I have also been doing my Patreon thing uh, where you go to my, my, uh, my page on Patreon and I'm doing a lot of live streams there. This time, though, we're in Beatport land. So I kind of want to give you guys some of the vibes of the way that I'm playing and then pick it apart. All right. So let me, um, let me set up something. One of the things that, huh? yeah, some, some, somebody's got a question for me. What's going on? Oh, Cyber Jungle. Ah, what's going on, brother? I actually have in my studio a old school Bozak rotary mixer. Now, a lot of the current DJs and people that have been on the scene probably for the last 10 years, 15 years, have probably never seen these. An old school DJ like yours truly started out first in the hip hop vibe using an old Gemini mixer, which is about old as shit. And there were, you know, the basic ones, crossfader up and down. But then I started playing 
the more disco sessions. And I went to go check out guys like Larry Levan in New York City at the Paradise Garage at the Loft. And they had this rotary mixer. Now, the rotary mixers are great when you're doing long, really um, very long-held mixes. But they are challenging in the sense that they don't have quick transitions unless there's a specific fader that's been put in there. So your mixes always have a much longer transition, and they're great for those blending. And if you could layer one or two tracks, it really creates a very smoother, richer overall blend. To get that effect, I tend to mix vertically. Um, so whenever you're seeing me mix, generally you're seeing me bring up the volume from bottom to top. Why do I do that? A lot of hip-hop DJs scratch, so they're kind of doing the, the crossfade thing. That's how a lot of hip hop DJs tend to scratch, and it gives you basically a mix um, range of one to five. It's it's very it's very broad it's very narrow, and since I like using long mixes, I prefer to use the vertical, which gives you basically you know one to zero to ten as opposed to zero to five. Um, so let's see. Lee Bucks, yeah, the rotary mixes are definitely difficult to scratch with. So if you like scratching, I'm going to recommend you stay in a fader kind of um, arrangement. It's going to be a lot easier for you to be able to mix within this. Um, and also cut and scratch. A lot of the layering that I do, some of the drops as you probably saw me do before, I backspun three tracks and just let it drop to one. A lot harder to do on a rotary mixer, but when you've got four tracks up, I can just quickly backspin and then pull all the faders down and then drop to that one. So, uh, let's see. I, I got a question on the Beatport official. Ah, that, that's them talking to me. Uh, Air America, do I miss using the 1200s? Well, what's interestingly enough is I'm actually going to be doing a vinyl session in the upcoming weeks on my Patreon site because I love playing vinyl. It's a completely different animal to playing on CDJs, and here's the reason why. A lot of the records that were pressed back then weren't necessarily locked in by computers. Like, if you're playing disco classics or early house records, they drift. Since... It's locked on vinyl. You have to be able to ride the pitch adjust in order to maintain mixes. It's a lot more complicated, but it's also just a bit more of a feeling of accomplishment, especially if you manage to get to three turntables. So I'm going to be doing some of those sessions, my live vinyl sessions. What I'll say is that I, what I miss about playing on 1200s is sometimes just the feel from a tactile perspective. Um, but what I love about playing on new technology is it gives me the ability to really do things that are not locked into what the tracks that are pressed on vinyl. Because here's the thing, when you press something on vinyl, that's the music. You can't loop, you can't shift it around, you can't change anything on it. You have to have two copies to cut back and forth and I got pretty good at that, From that comes from hip hop to extend the break and then you have to you know cue up a third track it's a lot more juggling involved when i'm here i can start queuing up loops and set up things ahead of time and have them looping in the background and be able to do live on the spot remixes so i'm gonna do a quick little set for you guys and then let's just pick it apart so you can kind of get a vibe of what i'm doing here
When was my first time shopping? So that was a bit of my four deck mixing technique and what you guys probably caught was I was mixing some classics with some current tracks and I tend to do that a lot. I love reintroducing classic tracks but in a new contemporary format. Um, a lot of my sound is built on Latin and tribal sounds so I love kind of sneaking in this tribal loop to give it that feel. Now what I did was I have this Yul Barnum track by uh, with the Jihad Muhammad BTD remix, which samples a kind of a classic uh, tribal loop, and I literally just looped that for one bar. So it just kind of gives you this.
and I pull out the bottom end on that so that basically all you're hearing is the top end. Before that, I was looping the uh, sampling track, uh, the Christian Nielsen remix of Gene Ferris, and uh, I think it's uh, uh, Oliver Dollar and Gene Ferris. That was the earlier kind of Jack and disco vibe. And what I was looping in the background, which was building up to the drop, was Professional Widow, Armand Van Helden's track, but I kept looping that one bar, actually two bars before the, the beginning. Oh, still got the crossfader on. <laughs> um, what I was doing was looping the, right before the breakdown, So that when it broke down to the main honey bring, honey bring It Close to My, I had that ready to go. And I brought in the a cappella of Danny Teneglia's Music is the Answer. So here I am kind of introducing a couple of classic tracks over a brand new track just to give it some fresher perspective. Now, uh, let's see. Um, got a question from Snacks. Okay, it's three in a row. Okay. Are there certain keys that work better for the beginning, middle, and end of a set? And is there some sort of formula and music and musical keys progression for building a set? You know, what I find is, as opposed to building um, a track based on keys, I, a set based on the key of the track, I go by the vibe of the track. So my career started off basically playing from an empty room to the peak hour of the night, to the empty room at the end of the night. So playing really long sets allowed me to build the mentality of, okay, here's the beginning of the night when basically the bartenders are there and the people are still cleaning up everything, getting ready for the crowds to come in. The early crowds that come in, when the dance floor is packed and heaving, jamming, and then the tail end when the room is kind of filtering out hardcore dancers at the end. Uh, I kind of took the cue from Larry Levan to Paradise Garage. I tend to start off with a slower BPM in the beginning, if I'm playing a full night set, uh, and start off a bit deeper. So obviously my sets are house, so I'm, I'm focusing on the house vibe, but I may put in some African sounding tracks. Just keep the vibe deeper in the beginning to allow people to settle in. So for all of you out there who are resident DJs, I'm pretty sure you can kind of vibe with this let it start off slowly as the room fills up the tempo goes up so does the energy and the vibe and the volume i actually start off at a lower volume in the beginning uh hold on a second mike just kick the there you go adjust that homie gotta be careful there you go a little bit more sorry about that guys just got a little camera snafu a little bit more rotate it there we go Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so I start off with a slower tempo, lower volume, and then as the room is filling up, I'm bringing in tracks. It's not about the key progression as much as it is as the vibe progression. And I save my peak hour tracks for the peak hour of the night. Now, what's interesting is I also play in places like Ibiza, and some of the, the clubs that I've played in actually have windows which lets you see the sun come up <clears throat> so i started doing what i call sunrise sets towards the end of the night i tend to get a bit deeper again but a lot more spiritual and a lot more euphoric as the sun is coming up and i think that gives you a journey to start from the beginning to the end of the night all right what are my thoughts on drinking while playing sets you know it's interesting <laughs> everyone has a different tolerance to how they proceed you know how they're they're doing their nights some people really love to be 100 percent straight no filter no no alcohol no drugs no nothing i tend to do my sets that way because i i focus more some people like to drink in it or, or smoke weed or whatever it is i'm not judging i just personally from my own point of view don't use and, and don't need to do that i don't mind a, a drink or a shot or two i tend to be partial to tequila uh i find that the more um, the, the the more chemically altered you are, um, 
the harder it is to keep things straight in your head. And I, as being very technical, always want to be 100% laser focused on between me, my communication with the crowd, and also my technical layout of how the night is going. So that's kind of why I personally don't really go in for the drinking. Other people get more creative and they start pulling thoughts out of weird places. It's kind of like being in the studio. Um, let me see. Knowing that the CDJ3000 can assign channel 1 through 6, are you requesting the 6 CD setup on my rider soon? Well, this is what I like adding in terms of options. Uh, the DJS1000, my boy DJ Sneak is really proficient at it. I'm still kind of getting my vibe on it. But for me, I think I would do four CDJs is more than enough for me unless I'm going back to back. So like if you're playing back to back with someone, then if each of you want to have six, um, three CDJs a piece, then I think that six CDJs works very, very well. And the good thing with the V10 mixer is you have two different headphone monitoring uh, capabilities. You've got the front and then you've got uh, the uh, phones B and this mixer actually has two different points if you can kind of show them the overhead so if you have that one that's my main headphone but then if I've got a guest the little button allows a guest DJ to be doing whatever they want and I don't have to hear what they're queuing up in the past even when they've been two headphones whenever you click on the audition you have to hear what the other person is hearing it would always made it a little bit more challenging now they have set it up so they're two completely separate um, audition monitors so I don't have to hear what the other person's playing myself and my girl Krista Knight often play back to back so uh, and since I'm a turntable hog she's like you know what give me a little bit of space and I have a feeling Pioneer might have listened to her and she's like you know can I have my own headphone jacks so I have to listen to him and I can just come up with my own thing and then listen to the monitors um, so that's the vibe for being able to set this up me personally i would if i'm playing by myself four cdjs and maybe a djs 1000 is what i put in there uh lee buxton do i think a live stream set should progress in the same way as a club set or do i feel the scope to take it up and down more as there's no dance floor to control you know one of the things that's interesting i've been doing so many live stream sets recently um obviously we've all been locked behind our doors during the uh pandemic uh, some dance floors are starting to open up, but you know, being a DJ, it's very difficult to get a vibe if you don't have a crowd in front of you. You kind of have to imagine it in your head. Now, that being said, there is scope for creating unique listening sets so that if you want to dramatically alter the tempo, dramatically alter the sound and the vibe, let's say, you know, um, might be playing house and then drop into Latin and then get out. Or, or drop into hip hop or whatever. There's, there's scope for that. I think it's good to let people know what they're gonna be listening to on a live stream. Um, like when I'm doing my back on wax vinyl sets, I'm gonna be going back into my vinyl and then I might do a disco set. Uh, I think there's definitely scope for doing live streams and doing sets that are much more experimental. And then you could also do more traditional live stream sets. So I think there's room for it all. Um, let me put up a different track because you guys must be getting tired of listening to that track in the background. Uh, I'm going to pull up. <clears throat> you know, I know I've been talking for a minute and my girl tells me I do like to talk. Uh, let me just switch out.
Now, what you probably saw me sneaking in as I was kind of hitting that trigger button at the very end. One of the other things that I highly recommend for DJs is to create their own template of sound effects. Uh, I created drum rolls, big reverb effects, and what that allows me to do is to create dramatic tension in sets and in that the track may not have a, a breakdown or a drum roll or something in there, but I want to introduce it. Um, and having Vortex allows me to set these things up and then time them so that I can create really precise drops. So I think the idea that I would definitely want to leave with people is create within your setup. And that's in record box, depending on what type of, if you're using um, tractor or whatever have you, create palettes of tools. Um, the reason I'm able to remix on the fly is because I have very carefully arranged where all of these tools are. So I'm going to talk really quickly about how I've set my stuff up. I have playlists that are um, descriptive to me. For instance, on my classics, I have request line classics. That's what I, when I was doing my, my request line um, live streams. Um, underground house classics, Chicago classics, UK classics. If I go into like what I call my little tech deep um, playlist, I'll have House Nation vocals, House Nation tracks, S Man 90s vo vibe box vocals, tracks, glitter box vocals, glitter box tracks. What these playlists do is it gives me the sound that I'm playing for. And I know that all the tracks that I put on this playlist are going to be aligned with that sound. Now, there's no right or wrong way. It's whatever will allow you to set up your playlist so that you can find music fast. That's the real key to this, organization and finding your music fast. The other thing that I do is I separate vocals from tracks so that I know if I want to, I tend to play a lot of vocals. So if I know if they're, and I want to go to vocal track or I want to go to just an instrumental or a dubby type of track, I know where to find them. The other thing I do is I set up loop banks for my acapellas, my drum loops that could be beats, my bass line loops. Everything is arranged so that I can jump in them, bring up loops very, very quickly to layer underneath tracks. Now, you probably have noticed that I tend to play with these four tracks, but they sound like one. Every component that I'm playing or loop has an element that I want to add to an original track that I'm playing. You know, so I do some re-edit tracks. Like right now, this is uh, Kumbia Can't Sleep um, on my Secret Weapons thing. And I want to add something that's, let's say, a little bit techier in the background for it. So let me go to something right here, and I'll show you a, a quick bio. What I mean.
So a lot of times I'm ending sets in a very dramatic fashion. Uh, and as you saw, I was just layering some of the kind of dirtier vibes of the circuit track with this classic Chicago track called Some House. All right, there's a couple of questions. Let's see. Waterproof hoodie. When are you going to get Pete Tong to put you back on Radio 1 Essentials? It's been too long. Uh, you know what? Um, it's a good question. Because I do my own radio show, Release Yourself, pretty much on a weekly basis, uh, the way that actually got started, my own radio show, I actually got my start on Pete Tong's Essential Selection. Uh, this is, I believe, back in the mid-90s. Uh, Pete had asked me to come on and um, guest for him on one show. And then the, the producers of the show said, hey, listen, Pete really liked what you did. Uh, we like your voice. Uh, would you be interested in filling in for Pete? So I actually took over a couple of his essential selections um, and I believe the uh, company was called Wise Buddha at the time that did the radio shows. Uh, and I had so much fun. Actually, I interviewed Armand Van Helden on one of them when he had his track, You Don't Know Me, and that went to number one in the UK. From there, I got asked by Kiss FM to do my own radio show. Uh, so my radio career started in the UK from Pete Tong's Essential Selection. So always much love and shout out to Pete Tong because he really put me on what I call my extended radio path. I used to do college radio when I was in college back in the day, but nothing like being on Radio 1 and having a, a show like I have now with Release Yourself that uh, I'm closing in. I'm four shows away from having my 1,000th radio show, which is bananas to me. Um, uh but, you know, whenever Pete wants me back on, all he's got to do is say, hey, Roger, you want to take over again? And I'm more than happy to do it. Uh, Mega Swag on said, do I get inspiration from listening to different genre DJs? Absolutely. Matter of fact, kind of one of the guys who I really, really respect is guys like Ronnie Size, LTJ Bookham, Goldie from the drum and bass vibe. Early influences were hip hop DJs like Red Alert um, and the more technical DJs from that era really uh, impressed me on the importance of being technically sound. Uh, my man DJ Scribble from the hip hop, you know, when it comes to tech technicality, guys like Scribble, um, super technical hip hop DJ, and a lot of my technique has hip hop influences in it. In terms of um, the more dance genre, Frankie Knuckles, uh, I actually lived in the same building as him in New York um, for many years, and I looked up to him so much for his ability to put a vibe in a room. Tony Humphreys was one of the... Tony Humphreys and Timmy Regisford were two DJs in New York, uh, early underground DJs that were on uh, WBLS and Hot 97, which were um, big radio stations there. And from them, I got this vibe of mixing in vocals slowly and layering them in and holding really long mixes. And that really influenced my technique. Um, Larry Levan was a big influence. Um, there are some ultra technical DJs. It's interesting. Um, somebody mentioned Laidback Luke. Laidback Luke is probably one of the nastiest DJs you're going to see, regardless of what genre he's playing, because he's also technically comes from a hip hop and techno background. And that's how he kind of got into his vibe. Um, David Morales was a big influence in terms of uh, layering how to use kind of like the drops, the bottom end, the filtering, the high end. He was really, really big on that. Guys like Joe Clausell laid out building a vibe in a room with very soulful vocals and soulful tracks. Danny Teneglia, definitely one of the masters of the long sets. And I honestly think there are very few people who can touch Danny when it comes to putting a vibe in a room and holding a room for an incredibly long period of time. So Definitely, I've influenced by lots of DJs, and I'm always interested in seeing new DJs. So now, you know, you got DJs like Sam Devine that are killing it. My girl Kristen is uh, Kristen Knight is in, is, a, is a technical beast. She plays on four decks as well. I don't like to say she tech she plays like me because her style is different, but she comes from an open format. 
um, to house, which is interesting. That technique of being able to read a crowd and transition and change the vibe is is a very uh, understated but highly important um, ability that a DJ needs to have in order to be able to play in different circumstances. Um, there's a lot of of women right now who are really, you know, killing it on the scene. Um, you know, friends of mine from the UK, um, Siggy Smalls, shout out. And I think, you know, especially now in this day and age, is it's very important to make sure we keep the doors open for all men and women to be able to really make their mark here. <laughs> Fenny, Fenny President says, stop talking. You want to hear more beats? I'll play more beats in a minute. Uh, I just want to answer some people's questions. Um, since I'm here. So let's see. One of the other things that people really know me for is my kind of old school house classics um, sets. And I think I get requested that so often. I'm going to do a quick little house classic set for you. Let me just pull something up. This is, com by the way, guys, this is all completely on the fly. I don't prepare my sets uh, as much as I prepare the setup. So let's let's get into some classics and see how uh, how we can uh, vibe here.
there. Just kind of throwing down a little classic set for you, giving you some vibes right there. All right, let me ask her a couple of questions. Uh, Johnny Mantequilla, Johnny Butter, <laughs> any advice for practicing as a DJ beginner and starting to get a grip on mixing tracks? Like, would you rather suggest trying to build sets first or focus on the technique and not care much about building sets? All right, one of the things that's very important to remember as a DJ is no matter how technically skilled you are, if you can't play music that the crowd wants to hear, you're going to lose them. And if you can't play music that's going to inspire the crowd to want to listen to you, you're going to lose them. I always think build your sets first because your technique comes from your source material. Make sure you're playing what you love and get intimately knowledgeable, especially if you start off with a small, short set, let's say an hour. That's a good place to start, which is about, you know, given a four or five minutes, let's say 12 tracks. Start with your favorite 12 tracks and kind of arrange them in a way that allows you to want to play the set from beginning to end. And literally, don't even bother mixing it. Just start from the very beginning, just arranging them. You could do it in Ableton or, or, or anything else or play them out here. Just work on your arrangement first and then start to build the technicality once you're familiar with the tracks. All right. <clears throat> Waterproof Hoodie wants to know, do I prefer making edits of songs ahead of time or do I like to add different vibes with loops and mixing live? All right, so I tend to almost always remix things on the fly. Um... But I do like sitting down and taking inspiration from my live kind of remixing and loops and then create my own edits to play out, especially if there's a certain balance to tracks that I want to get and allow me to have my own unique little weapons. That's why I've kind of been dropping my little secret weapons tracks because I've been taking tracks from different formats, sometimes like I did one um, with Aguanile, a Latin track, um, and then kind of did my own tribal house version of it. That's to be allow me to play within my format and kind of keep it like that. So that's my re-edit. What I like to do then is take other tracks and create something unique on the spot so that every single time I'm playing, it's not the same set. And uh, a lot of times, you know, it's easy for DJs to get caught in the comfortable set trap, which is you play the same set, same tracks, the same arrangements, and people know what you're going to play even before you play it. Uh, nowadays with social media and with things being recorded, pretty much every set that people play gets put up in some way, shape, or form. If you don't vary what you play, you're going to basically wind up becoming a repetition and lose people's interests. Uh, let's see. What else we got? Do I warp or grid my acapellas? You know, I try to... Uh, one thing that I like about um, Rekordbox is that you can put everything on the grid. So here's the other thing, the little, other little secret is every track that I put in Rekordbox, I make sure that I analyze it so it, it locks it to a grid, which really helps n tracks not to drift as much as they normally would if you didn't analyze them. And that allows me to bring in four decks and be able to lock things a lot easier. Um, sometimes acapellas are tricky. The the updated record box has um, um, different um, features to allow you to map acapellas to a grid. So there are ways that even if, uh, especially when you talk about like old disco tracks or even hip hop or any other types of acapellas that really drift, um, especially with the delivery, sometimes they're not on the one or whatever have you, you can go in and adjust it. Or you can take the long-term approach and drag it into Ableton, chop it up and really line it up tight. Um, so all of my acapellas are analyzed. And what I found is that some of the older acapellas that I analyze have the wrong BPM on them. And I'm just going crazy trying to figure it out. So then I'll just go by ear. And you may see like a 66 BPM on the acapella and there'll be 124 that I'm playing and be like, wait a minute, that's wrong. I've had to understand that that mapping 
if the BPM was wrong, but it sounds right and it's locked in. So I always go by ear. Your ear will not fail you. Sometimes technology will, but if you trust, it's kind of like using the force. If you trust your ear, go with that overall. Um, a lot of DJs say, okay, uh, Cubit says, a lot of DJs say that reading the crowd is the most important skill in DJing. And the way to judge a DJ is to see how a crowd reacts. How do you judge radio DJ sets like essential mix, though? How do you recognize really great radio mixes? And how does your process for creating a radio mix differ from a live mix? Um, 100% the hallmark of a great DJ is somebody who understands the crowd they have before them and knows how to play music to create an emotional response from that crowd. And that's why I like starting off deep and slow, building it up, breaking, you know, having peaks and valleys when I'm playing for a live audience. When I'm doing radio sets, I'm thinking of what I'd like to listen to. Now, sometimes I'll do my radio set based on me imagining a crowd in front of me. Other times, I listen to music. I'm a music lover. So I'll listen to other people's kind of podcasts and sets and see how the transitions go to keep my interest in listening to it. That's slightly different than playing for a crowd in front of you because there are things you could do live because it passes by in a moment. When you're listening to things on the radio, there are it kind of stays a bit longer. I think you have a bit more freedom to vary BPMs and different ideas when you're playing for the radio. But a great radio mix is basically, did you love listening to it and will you listen to it again? Do I ever, uh, mega swag on, do I ever use turntablism in my sets? You know, as you kind of saw, I cut and scratch a lot. Um, I'll do a lot of cut back and forth with two tracks. Um, the hip hop technique is taking like, let's say, the half beat before to create this um, snare beat. So let me show you what I mean by that. Let me pull up a track. Let me show you a little bit of... Uh
Yeah, it's kind of like some of the vibes that I took from hip hop and married that into house. So that kind of turntablism of cutting the beat up like one beat before bringing in the snare to get the clap, clap, boom, boom, clap, clap. That's a very hip hop technique that I brought from those days of playing on vinyl to create a different type of effect. And whenever you see a lot of hip hop DJs playing, you'll see that, you know, especially when they're doubling up a track. Let's see, what do we got here? Huh? I can't see it down there. Hey, Alex M. Krakens, what were my favorite clubs that I like to play in New York City and do I prefer bigger rooms to smaller community venues? You know, <clears throat> in New York, some of my favorite clubs to play at, um, I played at uh, the Tunnel I played at the Octagon, which is where I had my residency for Ego Trip. I played at Mars, where I started off my residency for Ego Trip in the basement of Mars, which is a very intimate room. And I love those intimate, dirty, sweaty, non-COVID friendly at this point in time, but definitely the very underground dark rooms were some of my favorite sets to play when it was Really hot, really sweaty. Everybody's close up on each other, but the energy is so thick. Um, I played Sound Factory, which was amazing, which then later on turned into Twilo, and I played Twilo. Um, Sound Factory Bar was an amazing room. Um, around the world, I've played places like Ministry of Sound in London, which was amazing. Womb in Tokyo, one of my favorite places to play was Yellow in Tokyo back in the day. The sound systems were just unbelievable. Um, Zook in Singapore, uh, they had a, a Gary Stewart um, install sound system, which was unbelievable. Um, playing at Cream in, uh, in Liverpool, they had a Faison sound system, which was unreal. All these sound systems are amazing to play on and to have that kind of control over the crowd, dropping out the bottom end, bringing in the high end. You know, those are some of the most memorable nights that I've played. Um, and, I, and I've been very blessed to be able to see a lot of these. New York City is definitely always going to be probably one of my favorite places to play at just for like that vibe. You know, places like Save the Robots, love those places. Um, so Luke, uh, the Royal official asks, what type of music do I listen to wind down? I love chill tracks. I love hip hop. Uh, I love listening to probably the best way I would describe it is what, uh, Jose Padilla, you know, God rest his soul. He just passed on recently. The genre he created, which was chill out from his Cafe Del Mar series is a broad section of kind of like electronic down tempo artists like bonobo i love what he does it's just some of the perfect listening music to kind of really unwind and give your head some space i um i'm a big fan of massive attack uh the atmosphere on those tracks is just unreal and you can really lose yourself and just kind of float away in those so i really like those tracks to kind of like chill to relax bit of dub reggae in there. So, you know, definitely having an eclectic ear is important to allow that to also assimilate into my own personal sound. Um, what, uh, Vala Music asks, what do I think is the process for a good idea in the studio to become a worldwide hit? You know, I gotta be honest with you. I, um, I don't think I really approach tracks in the studio with the idea of, okay, I need to make a worldwide hit. I think the thing that happens is something resonates. I've always gone in terms of my productions, what am I feeling at the moment? What's the vibe? Some tracks I do are extremely underground and you know they don't have great sales potential, but it's an idea that I need to get out. And some tracks just resonate with people. So I think the idea is go with your gut, go with your heart, and see what, where that leads you. See what the vibe is and where you want that particular song, what do you want it to communicate? Um, 
Let me see. What's the best track ever produced, in my opinion, or top three? God, I hate those type of questions. Uh, I don't know what the best track ever produced is, in all honesty. There are some of my favorite tracks. Everybody Loves the Sunshine by Roy Ayers, just because it evokes such an amazing mood. Um, Unfinished Sympathy by Massive Attack. Um... Um, finally, Kings of Tomorrow. And I think that the thread that's in common with each of these tracks is they all made me feel something. Put a thought inside my head uh, that evoked an emotion and a time and a place. And I think that is the hallmark of a great track. Not necessarily that they're all the best mix, because some of them can sound impeccable. You know, Prince's early tracks are just some of the most unbelievable. Uh, there was a track uh, he did called If I Was Your Girlfriend. Um, just some of the most amazing produced records that just put your mind in a certain place and make you feel something. That, to me, is the hallmark of a great track. Um, DJ Brent Mine, When I Stream. Since we aren't in clubs listening to music with massive sound system, how does this impact what to play and how to play it? Well, I've been doing radio shows for quite some time now and what i've come to find out is that the stuff that i play on my live streams are things that you can actually hear if you just have your headphones on so i've kind of listened to a lot of my tracks in my headphones and then if sonically i can really hear and kind of feel them that tends to be what goes into my sets for my live streams and i also play a lot of vocals which people can identify so if i put a track under it that maybe is more for feel that's okay because there's an identifiable musical element that always comes through um dj lagarza says i believe that your playlist is your best weapon i've heard many djs that their technical skills are not good but their playlist is awesome and i keep on listening uh, can you scroll down on that bro uh, what do i think i think that your playlist is definitely one of your most important weapons in your repertoire as a DJ. You got to have your music tight. Now, technically, if you can then take that playlist and present it in a creative way and do it seamlessly, people will remember that as an experience. But if your music is just not connecting, it doesn't matter whether you can play on 25 turntables at the same time. If no one cares what you're playing, no one's going to listen. So you got to get your... Your beats straight, your vocals straight. How to make, uh, Jim Cootie says, how to make vocal loop into mix perfectly. Oh, well, the first thing is, um, I would say analyze your acapellas if you're doing it, if you're talking about an acapella. Um, or um, if it's just a vocal on, on a track that you're laying over, make sure it's analyzed so that it locks in time. I always try to find an instrumental spot in a track if I want to bring in a vocal. Um, so let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to play a couple of tracks where I want to bring in another vocal out of a vocal that I'm already playing. Uh, let's see. Here we go.
So as you were seeing, what I was doing was when I found an instrumental part of the Free to Be Me track, I was looping that. But for the DJ Spin and Troy Morton's remix of God's Got It, I just looped the one bar before it broke down to the vocal. So what that allows me to do is see very, very clearly where the vocal is going to end, going to enter. Let me just put a little loop here. And what that means is I can now drop in that vocal whenever I want from the second track. So I loop on the fly using the quantize so that the beat, the loop locks in perfectly on time and it's seamless. Then drop in the other vocal. And then when I wanted to get out of the God's Got It because the vocal just keeps on looping, I found a little section that I just created a really tiny sliver of, uh, of a vocal, put in a looped it, put an acapella, of, put like a delay effect on it, and then drop the bottom end out of the Free To Be Me, let that open up to drop to where the vocal comes in again. Um, so the good thing about having like CDJ 3000s or the 2000s is you can see the graph in front of you, which tells you where the drops are coming. That visually allows you to quickly jump to each part um, and just really loop right before it. So you're constantly always anticipating uh, if you've got three of if you've got three or four of them it, it allows you time to set everything up so that you can now not only program your sets in real time on the fly but start setting up two to three tracks in advance and in my mind i'm always thinking i'm trying to think five tracks ahead where do i want to be 20 minutes from now or the next five tracks that i want to play what do i want to get to and that allows me to drop things in beforehand but also if i want to change let's say the vibe of the room changes or i have another track that just has so much power or energy that i'm like okay now i want to take it here i could change it up in a minute because i'm already planning a couple of steps ahead all right let me uh let me see some questions I saw some. mike freak do i wear a different hat to dj and as a producer all right so when i'm producing music i'm usually expressing a thought or an emotion or i want to express something that's very internal however a lot of my ideas come from me playing out trying something on the fly and seeing how the elements of that work on the floor so if i'm producing a house track let's say i want to do something a little more underground and I think about a set that I played and there were some elements, let's say a tribal thing or a dirty techie thing. And I remember the element, I liked it. Then I'll go back, I might sample that thing or I might take a, a, a drum pattern or take a sound that kind of puts my headspace back to where I was playing and what the effect was on the crowd. So they kind of work closely with each other. Then when I produce the track, I'll play it out, see what kind of response what I did get gets and then see if I need to either pull some stuff out, add some stuff out, change some things. The arrangement can be important. Um, that's what playing out kind of can tell or dictate in terms of when I'm in the studio, my memory of what I experienced when I played out. That really affects when I'm in the studio. Uh, let's see. How do I like the CDJ 3000? What's up, Mike? <laughs> Compared to the CDJ 2000. So, the CDJ 3000 is a monster, guys. It's a beast. Um, I'm still getting used to all of the features of it. And in all honesty, I, you know, I work very closely with Pioneer, so I got a chance to see this when it was a developmental stage. And they changed a lot of things from development to here. Um, biggest thing is the screen the screen has just made it so much easier to see things and to really access it you know it's it's touch sensitive uh the waveforms are very big and you also get to see on top the track that's currently playing and then the track that you want to bring in to kind of see how they're laying over each other so that's one really cool feature that the 3000 has it's the cdj 2000s or the nexus 2s don't have um I think I'll probably need about another few weeks of really hardcore playing on them to kind of give you my full um, 
feedback on how you can manipulate it and then that's when I start kind of finding out things by mistake that I can then go okay check this out but right now I can tell you it's a beast it's stable it looks amazing uh, and it's just rock solid uh, DJ Foggy how do I come up with my brand names well you know I've got under the radar stealth uh, those are very military influenced and uh, brand names and they kind of come back from my military history uh, from years back training uh, ROTC Marine Corps um, Semper Fi uh, Hoorah actually <laughs> Hoo I'm going to think of uh, Buster Rhymes Hoorah um, Release Yourself really comes from the vibe of me playing out and wanting people to let go of all of their cares and their worries and just release what they have inside of them um, when they're on the dance floor, when I'm playing. So it's very emotionally driven. Uh, so it's kind of like between somewhere between the military and emotional. It's a, it's a weird one with me. But everything for me has to have a visual component. So any brand names that I come up with, I've, I've seen it. I'm, a, I'm an old school graffiti writer, so I kind of write it out in a tag and then see how it looks and then see if I like the way it looks as much as I like the way it sounds and that's kind of how I arrive at my brand names um, let's see uh, <clears throat> when playing out how often do I refresh my playlists uh, it seems like tracks only played once or twice now and then move on to the next new thing you know this is one thing that I will say is um really important to keep up to date with your playlist there's so much music coming out now that it's almost impossible to keep up with all of it what i do is i uh, arrange my playlists by sound so that i know what the vibe is so if i'm playing let's say a uh, tribal vibe a glitter box playlist a uh, 90s vibe i'll put the tracks that sound like them um, in the playlist, the ones that I am are the, are the most current hot ones or the ones that I know I'll play out are live at the top of the list and then they go down the list in terms of what gets played least gets played least. I refresh my overall list every six months or so. like I'll literally go, um, have I played this track in the last year? I'll listen to it and if it's not something that's gonna hold my attention, pull it off the list so that, you know, some of my playlists are like 600 tracks long. It's ridiculous. That's when I start going in and start chopping them down and really focusing on the tracks that I play. My house classics live in a certain list because those are house classics. Um, but my current stuff, I tend to rotate fairly often because I download and go through music every single week. Uh, it's part of my job, so I make sure I do it even to this day. Uh, during the pandemic, I've been going through music and replacing and adding stuff. Um, what's my preferred mixer? And if I can go back to back with any DJ, who would I pick? Well, I got to tell you right now, I'm kind of loving this V10 mixer. It was a bit daunting when I first saw it because um, it is like a spaceship control. You know, show, show them a little bit of, of what it is. This is kind of like, you know, Houston control <laughs> You know, station over here with all of the, you know, the six channels and and all the different uh, um, effects that you have, the isolators. Um, however, it's probably one of the most functional mixers that I've worked on, and it actually sounds great. Prior to this, it would have been the Nexus 2 for functionality, the Bozak mixer as my classic rotary dial mixer of choice is just the one that sounds light years above anything else for what it is. Um, in terms of back-to-back, -back, man, I, I got to say, there's so many guys that I respect. You know, obviously, there's my boys, the S-Men, where we do back-to-back, -back, DJ, DJ Sneak and Junior Sanchez. Danny Teneglia is somebody that uh, I respect immensely. Carl Cox is somebody that would be... Uh, um, I played with him uh, a few times, like right after him. Um, so he's somebody that technically... And just playlist-wise can go everything from the deepest house to the hardest techno. So he's definitely somebody who I think would make an amazing back-to-back -back partner. Um, Green Velvet, because Curtis is just 
insane, and I love his his persona and his vibe. Um, on the on the more Afro tip, guys like Osun Lade, I love his sound. So, you know, a lot of really cool DJs out there that I think would add something to the vibe. Uh, Choka asks me, what's my proudest moment of my career? There's a few proudest moments. I think when I did my Release Yourself residency in Ibiza uh, at Pacha, doing the closing parties the first year that I actually did it at Pacha, and I, and I had that amazing standing ovation at the end of my set for the closing party. It was probably one of my proudest moments DJing out, getting a Grammy was definitely a, a moment I'd looked forward to um, since I started making music. And actually, I, I was nominated the first time, but when I actually won a Grammy for Best Remix, uh, that just kind of was an unbelievable moment. But I honestly think the best moments are still to come. Uh, I've had number one records, which have done amazing, you know, another chance Going to number one was a surreal moment in my career. And, you know, every single set that I play for different crowds, that's a moment I, I'm, I'm incredibly connected to because of that connection with people. So I think the best ones yet to come, but those are some of the, the most memorable ones. Uh, let's see. How, uh, Johnny Mantequilla says, how does being a DJ impact you when you make music? I started by making tracks and then realized that DJing would help me a lot there. Do I have an example of tracks that you produce that got inspired straight from mix? Uh, yeah, some of my, um, the S-Men tracks, um, back, the first S-Men track we did was directly from a live set that was really inspired. Um, when I did my track Trouble Man, that was directly inspired from kind of like a bluesy soul vibe that I was floating in acapella over a track. And I was like, okay, great. I called my uh, vocalist GTO, who sung Turn On The Music, and he rocked that track. Um, this track I did recently with Oba Frank Lord, it's called Ama Roja. That definitely came from that Latin vibe from playing here in Miami. Uh, I was doing... Uh, my Sunday parties at 1-800-LUCKY for a period of time, my under-the-radar parties, and some of those parties just totally inspired that Latin feel. And I think it's kind of been amplified living here in Miami now. So shout-out to Oba Frank Lords uh, and the whole 305 crew showing much love for everybody here. So do I, uh, Smack San One asked, do I produce on speakers or on headphones? Um, depends on where I'm at. I have been touring so intensely right up until um, the quarantine that I had to do a lot of my tracks either in hotel rooms and on airplanes to try to just make sure I have output. So I've produced a lot of tracks on headphones, but nothing beats sitting in the studio and working on tracks. I've had to work in my home studio, which, by the way, the next Beatport Studio Sessions is going to be at my home studio here in Miami because I'm currently in the process of building my proper room here in Miami. So that's taken a little bit longer than I expected. Um, so maybe the next time I do a studio sessions, you'll get to check out my new studio here in Miami. Um, but having speakers in my home setup has really helped me to create a lot more. There's uh, the uh, collaboration I just did with Ella Henderson based on my Another Chance track, Dream On Me, which is doing really, really well. And some other tracks that I'm working on right now as I'm working towards my next artist album. So speakers always win for me. That being said, sometimes I get an idea when I'm like a mile high in the sky and I just pull out my laptop and start putting that idea down before I forget it. All right, let's see. Uh, I'm going to play a little bit more just to, uh, just to give you a little bit more of a vibe. So I'm going to go into a deeper vibe right now. Because one of the things that is important for somebody like myself, my sound started off in the very deep underground of New York City. Um, early Larry Heard tracks, Afro tracks, you know, 
early, you know, Osunlade, Dennis Ferrer, all these guys had influences <clears throat> that played, made tracks that influenced my sets over the years. And when I first started off, everything coming out of Chicago, Jungle Ones, Adonis, it was a lot deeper. And then I got kind of into more of a, of a tribal sound. And now kind of getting into the more, what's become very popular, the Afro vibe, I've connected to quite a bit of that, but I kind of add a little bit of a my own feel to it. So I'm gonna play a couple of tracks on that vibe, and uh, let's see what you guys think. This is kind of on the vibe of I do a, a series on my label Stealth called Rituals, and this is kind of the vibe of Rituals.
Yeah, so that's kind of my tribal vibes, that ritual sunset vibe, I like to call it. Getting those Afro vibes in there. And now, by the way, um, a lot of the tracks that I've been dropping here, you could definitely get on Beatport, like that DJ Chu's remix of Alma Roja that I just played. Um, that Borderline track, man, who does this one? It's uh, See Me Not. That's one of my favorite. I love that vocalist, by the way, who sings that. She sung on a lot of my boy uh, DJ Saab's tracks. Uh, amazing. Um, this child, the track, Cocorazón, either one, Cocoro Latino. And obviously, the Latin influence, as you can see, always comes through in my sound. Um, all right. Chiquelino asked me, has the pandemic influenced my creativity in music? You know, it's interesting when everything basically shut down it's like grinding everything to a halt and one of the things that i think everybody kind of probably fell into was that almost a funk it's kind of like damn we're locked in and i really fought hard against allowing that to define my vibe so what i wound up doing was taking more time in the beginning to like go to the gym at home, go paddle boarding, do yoga, um, get my mind focused in a place where I was good with myself. Then that transitioned over to my music. So then I started feeling more creative, but in different avenues. And I really started focusing on like my graffiti, <clears throat> my artwork, uh, and then creating new tracks starting to work on some more songwriting and my album. Uh, and that's really where I feel like I've kind of had this recharge of creativity. And like, I'm like 1,000 on all cylinders right now, just vibing, enjoying when I play. What it really has done is it's made me appreciate playing out more and the blessing of being able to do what I do for a living and I've always been appreciative of it, but I think it really put into perspective how blessed I am to be able to do this, especially now when there are a lot of people, you know, um, who just don't get the help from the government. I got no help from the government. The government was like, mm, you made enough money last year, go figure it out. And I was like, wow, I got to figure it out. I got no money. <laughs> so when you can't make money from what you love, you better do what you love so that that's the payment in and of itself, in a way. Uh, and get creative in how to, you know, hustle. I have a podcast I do called The Hustle, which is about the business side of things. And I think that's also very important. Rethinking the business aspect of it, but always focusing on what you love as the core of everything. Um, Madathra says, what are my favorite DAWs? I produce a lot on logic but i also work with ableton rewired through it i literally just got my ableton push my man mike idala loan me his uh my girl kristen's really kind of really a beast on on ableton more than i am i'm more logic uh but i've been working with ableton rewired through logic and what that does is it lets me and you'll see this by the way when uh i do my studio sessions on the 22nd on uh, my little home setup the kind of rewiring of, of Ableton through Logic, I tend to use Ableton to chop up loops and, and bring in effects real quick to test out ideas very, very quickly. And I use Logic for more of my recording of vocals and then really programming synths and getting really deeper into the slightly more engineering side or just kind of the more sound design side of things. And I just like the way Logic sounds the best. Um, and then Johnny Mantequilla, it might be a bit personal, but do you still tracks from your early days? I think, do I still like the tracks from my early days? I think that's what you're trying to say. Or did I upgrade them or just realize it was nothing but a step in the way? Man, having, making a track is like having a kid. You know, it's like every single track that I've done, even the ones where I felt like I could have, I've learned so much more now than I knew back then is a representation of what my headspace was at that point in time. And some of the stuff that I did early in my career, I find it hard to find the, those sounds without sampling them because the technology was different, so my brain worked differently. 
Um, and I respect and love it all because it's not only personal growth, but it's also a reflection of the technology and adapting to it. So sometimes now I feel like I have so many choices, it's almost hard to know where to start. So I force myself to try out new things, but then also go back and think about how I used to make tracks and try to get some inspiration from that. And sometimes I'll listen to my old track and go, yeah, I love the way that, that drum sound sounded like. I'm going to have to sample myself. Um, what are some of my favorite 70s salsa records? Well, like I told you, uh, well, let's see. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of All Stars um, lover from, from back in, in those days. And obviously, Celia Cruz, uh, Bemba Colora, which is more of a son type of track. Um, Chimbara, everybody knows Chimbara, Chimbara, Coco Chimbamba. And obviously, um, um, uh, Hector Lavo, <laughs> that um, Aguanile is probably one of my favorite, favorite, favorite classic salsa tracks. Um, Dan Klusky says, how do I approach those epic buildups and drops? What source process do you use for such a thing, for things such as creating drum loops? If you mean from a production standpoint, um, Every single track that I do, I'm usually sampling drums from another track or from some old record, reprocessing them, chopping them up and relaying them in. It kind of forces me to approach each track a little bit differently. So I try not to just get caught up in doing the same loops over and over again or I have one drum loop that I use on every track. <laughs> There's some producers that that's what they do. Every single track is the same beat. And some of my friends are like, dog, this cat used the same beat on the last 50 records. Um, and they, and they sample Todd Terry like a hundred thousand times. Um, I tend to do that to switch my drums up. Um, I do have some, uh, compression in the EQ presets that I really like to use. Uh, I approach the drops literally by stripping everything out of a break and then bringing the main elements back after the break. And then I construct the breakdown bit by bit so that I kind of like I may have a pad or whatever and I try to see what elements besides just a snare roll I can use to create dramatic tension it could be reverb it could be a percussive element it could be a vocal and I just kind of really play around until I feel something connects and that's pretty much what I'm using and then in terms of um like I said, my beats, I'm sampling tons of other people's records. I have tons of, of drum samples that I mine. But sometimes I like taking the snare off of a pattern because I like the way that the dirty air sounds after the snare on that verb. And I might reverse that verb and create something new to give a, a completely different sound, but with a familiarity that I really like. Um... Smacks and one says, "Can you scroll down for that, bro?" Which one? Oh yeah. Uh, how? Okay. So James Poto, James W. Poto says, "How do I see Ibiza in 2021 to 2022?" That is such a challenging question right now. I mean, you know, number one, we've just come through. Uh, we're still going through the uh, the election, so it's going to be interesting to see how America finally transitions but everything kind of hinges upon how we're able to come together and what's happening i mean right now most of europe is going back into lockdown um i think 2021 is going to be re it's we're going to be really optimistic if we're going to say it's going to be a kind of back to pre-covid uh i think the ibiza is going to probably look at a few years where things are going to get a bit challenging I think it'll come back, but it might take a little time. Kind of depends on what happens, you know, people's willingness to deal with vaccines or um, their uh, fear of traveling uh, and the ability for these places to actually open up. It's going to be a second, maybe 2022, but 2021 might be a very challenging year. Um, 
Uh, Johnny Mantequilla, another question. It's not a question, but as a few of I feel more confident going into the rabbit hole of music. Thanks a lot for spending time with us. No, it's my pleasure spending this time with you guys. I hope you guys got value out of all of this and have been enjoying the DJ Masterclass. Um, is there anything technical you guys want to know about how I'm playing on these decks? Uh, like I said, in terms of setting things up, it's very important to do the preparation. And, and for that, since I'm on, I work with Pioneer, I use Recordbox. I'm going to say definitely go check out the Pioneer website because I did a whole tutorial on how I set up my Recordbox, which might help you guys for organization-wise. Um, but while I'm on here, when I'm in here, it's kind of what I've been showing you for the past couple of hours, what my vibe has been like in terms of when I'm playing. So if you have any questions on that, let me know. I see DJ Foggy 1210. Can you give us an example of two deck mixing with rhythm and style as we all don't have four decks? Okay, so two deck mixing is going to really be about programming. Uh, and I've had to play a couple of sets recently uh, for friends of mine, just kind of like a little private thing. They didn't have four decks, they just had two. So what I think is going to be important with two deck mixing is especially if you're playing vocals, what I was showing you with the four deck mixing technique with which is looping, kind of like that, you know, that section before the vocal comes in, that becomes even more important for you to understand structure. So um, let me pull up a track. Um, that I just want to pull up something that has a vocal that you can then kind of uh, okay just bear with me because I want to find something that These are kind of looping things. I just want a kind of a vocal type of thing. So here's this thing from Rogue D. So as you guys saw, what I was doing, um, or as you heard, is I was 
looping the one bar before the vocal came in on the Give It Up Madan weapon thing that I did. Um, and before that, I was playing the Rogue D Burning when he had the kind of vocals going. Uh, and I waited until there was an instrumental part, which is kind of really cool because it, it layers in very, very well. I looped the instrumental part on the fly using Quantize. And then I had already mixed in the one bar before the vocal came in, so that percussion was already there. I released the loop uh, once I had the other loop going on the burning track so that it dropped into the vocal. Um, since it's on a breakdown, I pulled out the bottom end from the burning track to just kind of give it a bit more of that breakdown feel. Uh, I popped the bass line back in to give it a little bit of a momentary, you know, jolt, dropped it back out until the main part of the Give It Up Madan track came in. But what that allowed me to do was to create a bit more dramatic tension, and I only have two, two CDJs going. That's when you're focusing on programming even more because I don't have any other um, CDJs I could bring in to give me kind of like another loop to layer while I'm finding that fourth one to lay in that other track. Um, so I think knowing your tracks and kind of finding that one bar before the vocal comes in that you can loop that's a cool loop or it might be two bars before so you loop that always bearing in mind okay I gotta let two bars go before the vocal comes in and there's a lot of math there's more mathematics in the sense of understanding it in terms of the, the sequence of the track but that's how you can transition creatively when you just have two CDJs to work with. what are my favorite okay so what are my favorite filters on the DJM um so for the V10 mixer, man, this has got so much cool stuff on it. The one I tend to use the most is the high pass filter. So let me just, uh, uh, I use the high pass filter, which is over here. Uh, and that just takes out the bottom end. And that's really useful when I'm mixing tracks in or when I want to create kind of like a dramatic drop. So track is going along then break it down to a take the bottom end out and then let's say I want to do um, kind of what I like to call the isolator filter I change it to low pass filter and then just so you take out all the top end and maybe have another acapella going and I want to just focus and highlight the acapella while giving that bass in then bring it back. Good thing is you can switch between the high pass filter and the low pass filter very, very quickly. Then you have the main beat effects, which you can assign either to the master channel or to individual channels. And that one, the one I tend to use a lot is the spiral effect. And the spiral effect gives you this. Ooh, so sorry about that. Got a little carried away with the, uh, the speaker and the, the microphone volume. So one good thing about the um, the mix, the effect is it keeps on going after you cut off the channel. Um, and this one, it, I'm clocking it to 123 BPM, which is where I'm at right now. Three quarter gives you that da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. And what I like about it, it has this kind of um, filtered decay that just kind of, uh, as it decays, the bottom end is is kind of, filtering out like a dub reggae delay and that's what i really really like about that particular effect those are kind of like my favorite ones um junior star do i have specific equipment requirements for my performances or do i bring my own uh well i could tell you that right now you know I'm, I'm i'm fortunate to be in the position to make sure that i have an equipment writer for every performance that i do uh sometimes they may not have exactly my writer um until the 3000s came out, my um, rider was four Nexus 2 CDJs and then a DJM 900 Nexus 2 mixer. Now my rider's changed to being four CDJ 3000s and the V10 mixer. But if they don't have that, then I'll, you know, I'll settle for the Nexus 2 because I'm, I'm pretty much well versed on that. But that's pretty much what I work with. Um, and... Uh, you know, but there was a time when that wasn't the case. And I remember in the beginning when Pioneer first started um, doing these CDJs, I used to take two CDJs on the road with me when they came out with the 1000. 
because people just didn't have it. They had no access to it. So I had to bring at least, a, at least two to give me something to work with. Um, but nowadays, it's on the writer. Mega swag on. What would you say to someone who lost their motivation to DJ? Everyone is different with this. If you lost your motivation to DJ, I think the question you should ask yourself is why did you get started in the first place? What did you love about it? And sometimes going back to the basics is the most important thing. If, like me, I fell in love with DJing, not with, because when I first started out, there was no real money in this. It was the guy you paid 50 bucks to hide underneath the staircase and play at a club. I used to be a break dancer and a dancer as, when I was really, really young, and my friend was a DJ, and I used to love the way he controlled the crowd and the way he moved the crowd with what he was playing. That was my hook. So me learning how to DJ was direct result of me being a dancer going, I want to do what he does, and I want to make people dance. Um, and I've gone through points in my careers where there's highs and lows, you know, not everybody knows that there's lows in my career. Yeah, there have been some really difficult times. Um, times when I didn't, I felt like I didn't even know what to play. I'm like, I, they don't, I don't know what they want to hear anymore because everything's changed. That's when I went back and go, okay, well, why, why did I start this? Why, what do I love about this? And then I fell back in love with where I started. So sometimes you got to go back to the beginning and just fall in love with what you started with. What made you want to DJ? If your motivation was money, girls, guys, whatever it is, the fame, then chances are if things aren't going your way, you're going to want to lose your motivation and drop out quick. Or if that really wasn't where you wanted to go in the beginning, it's like, okay, I'm going to DJ until I become a famous, I don't know, model, or usually it works the other way around. Um, then you're not going to have the heart to stick it out when things inevitably get tough because that's the thing about a real career. No matter how high you go, there's always a low point. It's what you do after that low point that determines whether you're going to be here for a while. And I've been here for a minute, so I can tell you there's highs and there's lows, but I love what I do. Um, let's see, last question. If you have some great feedbacks on your first mixes, even from longtime DJ, what would you recommend as yourself? Would you go all in and share it with anyone or would you rather build yourself some great mixes of secret weapons before going public? It's a bit of a different time now. I Part of what I also talk to people about is in terms of career building. I believe you, in, in the current age of social media, people need to build their brand. So I'm a big follower of like guys like Gary Vee. Uh, if you don't know who he is, look him up. He's an entrepreneur, but he's very big on building your own brand. And I think... You create content, you um, show who you are as an artist and create content that imagine you would want to see or you would want to hear and then release that and continue creating. Even if you have one or two tracks, make more. Not every track is going to be slam dunk. And if it is, well, God bless you because I haven't figured out how to do that. But you just keep creating because everything's going to resonate with someone at some point in time. And the body of work is going to determine who you are as an artist and as a brand. And then you begin to build on that. As long as you maintain the focus and the core of what you love to do, that's going to lead you to what would be your version of success. Now, my version of success is doing what I love and being able to do it. Thankfully, it pays for my living. But if it didn't, I would still get another job and do this because I love it. And I've been in that position where I've had to hustle other things and still DJ because I loved it. So that's the thing. Spend as much time as you can doing what you love. And it's like you'll never work a day in your life because it's, this, is, this is what it is. You love it. All right. Um, let's see. I'm getting ready to wrap up pretty soon. Um, do you guys want me to do one more little set for you, get another little uh, technical vibe? Um, or if you still want me to answer some more questions? I've been having a lot of fun with you guys. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I hope I've answered them to, uh, in enough detail to give you some sort of value from this. Um, as much as I love playing, 
you know, I love uh, educating and I love connecting. And by the way, guys, if you want to catch me on my live streams, I, I also have my own set, my own page on Patreon. It's DJ Roger Sanchez at Patreon. I do something with my members, my VIP members, where I go out once a month and do a one-on-one -on -one, um, Zoom chat where I talk to my to my inner my inner circle people. I have a limited amount of those, and then everybody else who's on that gets to see my live streams and get access to my secret weapons. Um, so I'm, I'm giving free access to a lot of stuff on there, and I've got tons of live streams coming up, and also for some live streams that I'm be doing from some venues. Um, so if you want to kind of want to see me a little more regularly, catch me there. Also, throwing forward to the next Beatport session, uh, November 22nd, that's a Sunday, uh, I'm going to be taking you to my home studio here in Miami, where I've been working on a lot of tracks recently, um, show you how I built some of those tracks. I'm actually going to probably start something completely from scratch. I just literally got the push. I'm going to see if I get a chance to play with it before the 22nd. So kind of add that to my workflow. Uh, but regardless, I'll show you how I work with Logic and Ableton. Um, okay, so Pink of the Bear says, what are my favorite headphones these days? But I got to be honest with you, man. These Pioneer ones, Pioneer, um, they gave me a, a really lovely little gift here. I'll show you. Uh, they did this engraving on their HD ones. And these headphones are probably my favorite favorite ones to play because they've got great detail but they're robust i've taken these around the world and the problem i've had with a lot of headphones is some of them sound amazing and they just cannot take a beating they can't be on the road these i've had them since they've made the hd ones and they've been killer clear bottom end response tight i'm very very happy with them that's pretty much my standard not not because it's pioneer uh brand wise but they actually took the time to make a set of headphones that are pretty much spot on for dj for studio production i think you need something a little bit different but this one is great for bass response and clarity so you can kind of feel the thump in your ear from the bottom end which allows you to kind of keep that time tight and the clarity to mix properly and i try to guys very 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 important for those of you who play out, I don't have it here. I'm, I'm not wearing them right now because I'm here in, this, in my own setup and I keep the volume down a lot lower. I wear um, earplugs, filters for my ears that take about 15K off the top, really kind of protect my ears. I actually have tinnitus that I got many, many years ago that I've been controlling, um, but I've got it for life. So that was me playing without... Um, earplugs and just blasting like a lot of people. I don't know, some people have practically gone deaf. Protect your ears. Wear filters if you're in a very loud environment or keep the, the volume of your monitors down when you're not mixing. You know, it'll go up and down, but try to preserve your hearing, man, because once it goes, this is over. It's done. Um, I've been able to manage my tinnitus now to the point where uh, it's kind of like I've, I've learned to ignore it. So... Uh, I don't actually finalize my final mix downs on my records. I get it to a certain point and my engineers know how to get it to exactly where I want it to. Um, but it's a thing. So please preserve your hearing. Very, very important. Um, what's my opinion on romplers? I'm not quite sure what romplers is. Well, I've never seen romplers. Uh, what DAW am I using for creating music? Um, I'm using Ableton, uh, rewired through Logic, and Logic is my main one. Uh, tune in here on the 22nd for my in-home studio production uh, session. All right? And then... Um, you got a romper there? Ah, that what a rompler is. I haven't ever tried it. I don't even know what it is. So I'm going to have to look into that and see if there's any value in it. Um, is it, uh, DJ Lagarza, is it better to become a producer first than a DJ or the opposite? I think for visibility, productions definitely get your name out there because you have something that people can kind of latch on to. But I, I have a love and a passion for the art of DJing. 
turntablism, actual mixing. So for me, I got into this first. Um, a lot of DJs nowadays got into it the opposite. They made big records and then DJing became a way to kind of monetize their productions in a different way and that's their performance because they might not be rock stars, they might not be singers. So <clears throat> I think it depends on what you, what you fall in love with first. Um, let's see. Deal, uh, Johnny, I'm going to give you support. Dealing with quitting alcohol right now. Uh, let me tell you something. Take one day at a time when it comes to quitting anything. Uh, over, the, over the course of quarantine, uh, I was able to drop about 34 pounds. I'm a lot slimmer now than I was, let's say, at the beginning of, uh, of the year. And I've been kind of working from between training and for many years and trying to figure out different diets to get to a certain healthy place. Funny enough, I had to kind of stop traveling to take a minute. Um, and when I actually found out and when I actually got to it is because I changed some fundamental things about my life. I changed my diet. I started focusing more on cooking at home, doing certain things. I'll get around to how this relates to alcohol in a second. My environment was different because normally I'm in a plane, I'm hungry, I'm eating, you know, whatever crap they have on the plane and trying to control it. And it has been a struggle to drop weight for the last 10 years easily. Um, and I've gone through periods where I've dropped and I, and I haven't, but I had to change some things in my fundamental environment. Some of it was changed for me. I had to stop traveling. But now I created new habits within my changed environment. That's led me to stop eating sugary foods and different things and fried and different that. I never used to eat that much of it, but enough that it was unhealthy. Alcohol is the same thing. You're going to have to change your habits and change what puts you in front of alcohol first and then take it one day at a time. You're going to stumble and fall, get up again, do it again. Don't hold, don't, don't think because you fall once, that's it. No, the, the, the victory is in the every time you get back up and every day is a new one. You just take it one day at a time. Um, I think that one of the most important things I could say to everyone here today is that this, what I do for a living, DJing, is something that I've fallen in love with many, many years ago. There have been times when it's been difficult to um, make a living from it, so I hustled. And what DJing taught me was, if you love something enough, you'll work for it. I'm blessed to have DJ pay DJing and making music, doing what I love creatively, pay for my life and support my family and so on and so forth. That took a long time to get to this. But the thing that I always maintained was, I love this. And if you build your life based on doing what you love, the payback at the end is the fact that you've been able to do what you love. And then you can figure out how to monetize that in the end. There's lots of creative ways. But we're going to get into that on a different day. Um, you could definitely check out my social media pages like DJ Roger Sanchez, uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. I've got my uh, podcast called The Hustle where I talk about the business aspect of it and how to help monetize the what you love in terms of this world. Um, I hope you enjoyed my, uh, my technical vibes here today, and I hope it's inspired you. Uh, next time here on Beatport's Twitch channel, we're going to get into some productions. I'm going to create a track probably from scratch right in front of you and be answering questions. So if you have any questions about more production questions, bring it with you on the 22nd. All right, guys? Thank you very much. Peace out. Much love. And I hope to see you all on the 22nd.